I think so. <clears throat> okay, so welcome to the fourth um, Early Career Researcher ICMRBS webinar. Today we're going to talk about solid state NMR. And we have some lovely speakers lined up. Um, so just some housekeeping. Um, if you'd like to speak, um, email us uh, on Twitter or um, you can find our email addresses on our webpage. I think it would be really nice to have a, an NMR and computational methods session. I've got one speaker lined up for it so far. So if there's any computational NMR people out there, um, let me know, drop me an email. Um, if you'd like to join the ICMRBS mailing list, email Kevin Gardner. Um, and please don't record or share any of the talks today. Um, if we've got permission, we're going to upload the talks to the ICMRBS YouTube channel. Um, and if you have any questions, then drop them in the Q&A box as normal. Um, so I'm going to pass over to our first speaker. It's going to be introduced by Carol. Thank you. I'm going to introduce Lariani. Thank you, Lariani. Um, she began her NMR career during her PhD at the Institute of Structural Biology vision of Jean Pierre, um, working on structural and dynamical characterization of proteins involved in antibiotic resistances using solution state NMR. After her PhD, uh, obtained in 2012, Lariani continued to work in protein solution NMR at the University of Montreal, Canada, as a postdoc. In 2015, she began working in solid state NMR in the group of Anna Buchmann, at the MMSB, University of Lyon, France, where she is now working at a, as a CNRS permanent researcher. Her work focuses on viral assemblies, work including um, protein for hepatitis B and D, dengue, and SARS-CoV-2 viruses. Lariana, thank you for being here, and it's all yours. Thanks a lot for inviting me and for uh, this very nice initiative of organizing this uh, early career researcher, I think it's a really good idea. And today I will talk to you about the hepatitis B virus capsid seen by solid state NMR. And this work has been done in the group of Anya Buckman in Lyon. Okay. So I will first uh, um, uh, give you a short introduction about the virus hepatitis B. And then I will show you how we produce the HPV capsids in the lab and the carbon and proton detected uh, solid state animal spectra that we recorded. We have compared a lot of various capsid states, I will show you, and uh, I will also show you how we identified a conformational switch uh, induced by a molecular binder. So the HBV is still a major health problem because despite of the efficient vaccine, it still infects 2 billion people in the world, and they, this leads to around 1 million deaths uh, every year. There are some treatments, but they don't manage to completely eradicate the virus. The virus is composed of uh, DNA attached to a polymerase, which is protected by a capsid. This capsid is surrounded by envelope proteins and lipids. Here I show you an overview of the HPV life cycle. And quickly, so the variant enters into the hepatocyte, it releases its envelope and its uh, DNA into the nucleus. Then the mRNA are used to translate for the core protein, which will package the pregenomic RNA with the polymerase to make the major capsid, uh, but it can also package uh, assemble as an empty capsid. And to date, um, so it is not fully understood how this envelopment, envelopment step is made. So why do some capsids are enveloped and some are not? And then after it is enveloped, the mature capsids, infectious and non-infectious particles are released into the cells to infect more cells. So it is believed that maybe a conformational change uh, would uh, signal the envelopment, and it was postulated early on in 1982, but it was never shown experimentally. The HPV capsid is formed by 240 copies of a protein called the core protein. Its structure has been solved in 1999 by X-ray, and since then several other structures have been, have been solved by cryo-EM and X-ray. It contains four asymmetric subunits, A, B, C, and D. And the core protein itself is formed by an assembly domain 
which is sufficient for uh, the assembly, then a linker and a C-terminal domain, which can be phosphorylated and can interact with the RNA. And the questions we want to ensure, answer are, how does the capsid signal um, that is ready for the envelopment, and also what is the impact of the CTD present, the RNA, and the phosphorylation of the CTD? So to answer these questions, we want to use solid state enema because uh, it has never been used as a method to study this type of capsids. And the advantages of solid state NMO is that it's not limited by simple crystallinity, solubility, or size, and it can provide information about dynamics and interaction. Uh, we can get uh, information at the atomic level, and um, this can be fully complementary to the X-ray and cryo-EM structures which are already existing. So to do that, we perform different experiments using uh, 3.2 millimeter rotors, but also uh, 1.3 and 0.7 rotors to go uh, at higher frequencies. So we prepared the capsid in the labs. Um, actually, uh, so uh, thanks to plasmids and protocol from Michael and NASA group in Freiburg University. And the capsid auto assembled during the bacterial expression. Then we do a standard protocol for cell lysis and we separate the capsids based on their density using a sucrose gradient. And we can sediment the capsid directly into the NMR rotors. And we obtain this nice uh, capsid, uh, as you can see by elect uh, electron microscopy by negative staining. We have another expression system in the lab, which is the Wigeum self-expression system, which was developed by Marie-Laure Fogeron and Anya Bokman uh, some years ago. And we use the Wigeum machinery to synthesize some proteins. And this will be applied to the capsid. The advantage is that it, the system is closer to in vivo assembly condition. Also, it's an open system, so we can add the labeled amino acids or anything we want into the mixture to synthesize the protein. But the yield is, of course, a bit lower than in bacteria, uh, but still we can reach milligram amounts. So here I show you the first uh, solid state animal spectra that we obtain for the HPV capsid. This one is the truncated uh, capsid uh, with 149 amino acids, so it's called CP149. Uh, this was done in carbon detection on 3.2 millimeter rotors, and we assigned the protein. As you can see, the line widths are really nice, the resolution is good. It's similar to what has been observed for the HIV capsid observed in uh, Tatiana Polinova group. And then we did also the proton detection uh, spectra and assignment on the truncated protein using 0.7 and 1.3 millimeter rotors uh, in collaboration with ATH and Zurich. Uh, here is some uh, spectroscopic comparison about the two methods. Uh, of course, you need a lot more protein in 3.2 millimeter rotors, but you also get um, a more complete assignment. So that can be, be an advantage to, to have both. Uh, here in dark blue are the residues which could only be assigned in the carbon detection, but not proton detection spectra. Overall, the experimental times are similar for the, for the 3D spectra and assignment. Um, and just you can reach lower temperatures uh, at 3.2 millimeter rotors because you spin uh, less fast. Okay, if we go back to the spectrum, um, we could observe some interesting behavior of the capsid. Uh, in the term of peak splitting in the spectra, some residues actually did not give rise to only one signal, but several ones. For example, uh, the alanine 137 here, which is located at the inter, uh, dimer interface, we could see four, di four different signals for this residue. And if you see in the structure, actually you can see that uh, the environment is different and the distances are not the same into the pentamers and the hexamers. So the NMR can really probe subtle differences like the subunits asymmetry here between the A, B, C, and D uh, subunits of the capsid. And uh, in the protein, we were able to identify some peak splitting for 28 residues, which represents almost 20% of the protein. And they are all located at the interdimer interface. 
And for this, uh, uh, we use both proton and carbon detection spectra, uh, especially since the carbon detection has a, a bit more signal to noise ratio uh, compared to the proton detection spectra. But also uh, the proton gives uh, valuable information since uh, you can see here, for example, that you have a better dispersion than in uh, carbon dimension. So really carbon and proton detection approaches give complementary information. And if you have the chance to have enough protein, then both methods can, be, uh, can give you nice information. Um, then I would like to show you the spectra we obtain on the cell-free sample. So we're using the Widgeon cell-free system that I presented you in the introduction. So this time we use the full length protein, including the C-terminal domain. And since uh, the yields are not so high, uh, we need to use proton detection and especially uh, 0.7 millimeter rotors. So we spin 100 uh, kilohertz for this. And here I show you the comparison between the cell-free sample in green and the bacterial sample in blue. So overall, they, they both yield a nice spectra uh, with similar uh, proton line widths. And these are for protonated samples. But we can also um, uh, produce deuterated capsids using both uh, methods, both expression systems. And uh, the line width uh, improves by a factor of around 1.4 if you deteriorate your protein. However, as you can see here in the, in the orange spectrum, uh, some peaks are missing. And uh, it is because there is an incomplete back exchange in the capsid which is uh, located in two regions here in the center of the, of the core protein, in the center of the spike. And these residues are buried inside. They are not accessible to the solvent, so the back exchange cannot occur. And this represents 15% of the residues, so we really lack uh, important information in the deteriorated E. coli capsid. So that is an advantage of using a cell-free system because it allows to obtain 100% protonation of the amide proton since deterioration is achieved not by uh, the metabolism, but by simply adding the deteriorated amino acids. So um, after uh, studying this self capsids, we wanted also to, uh, to study different other types. And for this, the uh, E. coli bacterial expression system was a bit more convenient because we can yield uh, a higher, um, higher yield. So we have a lot of protein to play with. And for example, so we could produce the truncated protein, the full length protein, but also the phosphorylated protein using co-expression with the kinase, the plasmid, which was developed by our collaborators in Freiburg. And this phosphorylates uh, seven sites in the C-terminal domain. So then we can also compare the samples with and without uh, RNA, since um, uh, when it's phosphorylated, it does not package RNA anymore. And then we can disassemble all these uh, capsids using guanidine or urea to uh, get the dimer, and then we can reassemble them as empty capsids or uh, filled capsids with the pregenomic RNA, the viral RNA, that we can also produce in the lab. And here I will show you the comparison of the fingerprint uh, DAR spectra that we obtained for the different samples. And surprisingly, if we compare the truncated protein and the full length one, first uh, we saw that we were not able to observe the C-terminal domain because of its flexibility. And it is also missing actually from all the X-ray and the cryo -EM structures. So, it is not possible to observe it by using standard uh, solid state and MR spectra. Also, we can see the labeled RNA, which is labeled during the bacterial expression. But uh, more interestingly, we could see that the presence of the C terminal domain and RNA does not change um, things, anything in the spectrum. And uh, it only induces very small or non chemical shift perturbation. And it's actually similar if we compare with the phosphorylated uh, C-terminal domain, so with this uh, construct here in purple, you can see that the two spectra overlay perfectly. 
Here, no RNA uh, is visible because it cannot package uh, any RNA. Uh, and again, so we couldn't see any chemical shift perturbations. Uh, they are only very small, below 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 ppm. So that was our fir first uh, conclusion that uh, uh, even if you change the uh, RNA binding and uh, the presence of the C terminal domain, etc., there is there are none or small conformational changes in the capsids. However, we observed something much more interesting when we started to look at the reassembled capsids. So here I compare the full length uh, capsid from E. coli and the one that we reassembled in vitro with the pregenomic RNA. And here you can see. Uh, in the zoom, especially, that uh, we have strong chemical shift differences between the two capsid states. And uh, we identified two conformations that we called uh, conformation A for the E. coli and conformation B for the reassembled capsid. And actually, when we compared all the samples, we could see that all the E. coli capsids are in conformation so-called A, and all the reassembled one, but also the cell-free capsid, were found in the other conformation B. And that's really interesting because these two conformations were never observed in the literature before. And uh, with some more prospects, we managed to identify that this uh, conformation switch, conformational switch is actually induced by a molecular binder, which binds to the E. coli capsid, but it is released by the gel filtration we use for the disassembly of capsids, and it is not present in the cell-free capsids. So I cannot tell you the name of uh, the molecule because this work has not been published yet, but what I can show you is where this molecule binds. Uh, so we can um, map the chemical shift perturbation along the sequence. The CSP observed are very large, and we, we call it a conformational switch because uh, it really, uh, some CSPs are above 1 ppm, which is uh, very significant. And if we map these CSPs onto the structure, you can see that they are all located uh, in the same region. And it is very interesting because this region uh, was shown to be crucial for the capsid envelopment. So the pocket factor that we identified the first time that some, somebody identified it. And um, the only time it was mentioned in the literature is uh, Bettina Butcher, who's working on HPV by um, Quirium. She has seen an unknown electron density uh, in this pocket uh, once. But actually, we believe that most of the structures in the literature, are, uh, they have this um, molecular binder because they are all produced in the same uh, way and using the same protocols are also. And then we designed some mutants uh, to check if the binding will still be possible or not, and also to check the envelopment in cells. And we designed so the P5W mutants and L60W mutants, which uh, block the uh, molecular, the pockets, as you can see here. Uh, and indeed, uh, it prevented the binding of the molecules since uh, they were both found uh, in the form B, so the unbound form. And the test in cells done by our collaborators uh, have also shown that both mutants allow, still allow HPV replication, but they prevent the envelopment. So with this, uh, we uh, started to think about a hypothesis. And actually, so what we have shown is that solid state enamel revealed a pocket factor bound to the HPV capsid in this critical region for the envelopment. And we think this uh, conformational switch is linked to, uh, to the signal for envelopment that I mentioned you in the introduction. So our hypothesis is that the image of capsid could uh, uh, repre be represented by the B conformation that we, we have shown. And then the genome maturation could form uh, the conformation A, which would be, then be ready to bind uh, in the same pocket or maybe in another pocket. And uh, the P5 and L60 mutants 
have uh, so a pocket which is not accessible anymore and that explains what is when it was shown that it shows no or only poor envelopment in vivo and also in vitro and uh, our hypothesis then is that um, this molecule or a derivative of this molecule could act as an antiviral to block the capsid envelopment and then prevent the spreading of infectious variant because then the envelope proteins would don't have the space to, to fill the pocket anymore and to bind to the capsid. So with this, I would like uh, to thank uh, all the team and especially uh, so Shishan Wang who prepared most of the samples uh, together with Marie Dujardin, Mathilde Bridé, and Laura Cole, Marie-Laure Froigeron uh, for the cell-free experiments, um, Anya Bachmann uh, for all the support and the and uh, thinking about all this project, and our collaborators, Michel Nassar in Fragburg and uh, Beat Meyer at ETH Zurich. Um, and of course, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Lariani. It's a really nice talk, and we have time for questions. Um, what is the relevance of this interaction? It is clearly uh, a contamination from E. coli. Um, it's an animal participant. No, so, I, okay, it's a good question. And we have, we have thought about this uh, for a long time and uh, we thought it would be not so interesting. But um, the reason why we are interested in is because uh, it is um, clearly a region which is important for the envelopment. And then if we can uh, design some more molecules which resemble this, this one, then, uh, then we will be able to design some antiviral. And this is clearly a pocket which could make a difference in the treatment for HPV because all the other um, treatments they uh, are targeting another region of the protein, which is the interdimer interface, but no uh -huh. uh, antivirals are designed yet to target this specific uh, pocket. And uh, so we believe that it could be of interest for the HPV community. And of course, we need uh, some more proof uh, in the cells to see if it can have an impact on the, on the envelopment. Uh, but it's not an artifact from E. coli, actually. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, if more attendees have questions, can use the Q&A and Lauriani can, can ask. Thank you. We can go for the next, next one. Cool, thank you, Lorian. Um, so next up, um, we have um, um, Dr. Mark Antoine Sani. Um, are you here, Marco? <laughs> Hello, uh, you can start sharing your screen. So, um, um, so Dr. Mark um, Antoine Sani graduated with a master um, in um, physical chemistry science with um, distinction um, at the University of Bordeaux. Um, and he obtained his um, PhD from the University of um, Umeå uh, from Sweden and the European Institute of Chemistry and Biology um, from France. So he took on a postdoc position at the University of Melbourne um, um, in 2009 and was really just recently promoted to um, senior research fellow um, in 2020. So his field of expertise is um, biophysics with um, special interest in um, biological solid state NMR spectroscopy um, with the aim um, to develop um, an in-situ um, technique to study living cells and elucidate the role of uh, membrane lipids in the molecular mechanism um, of disease. Um, so he's an editor um, for the ENSMAG, um, the Austra um, Australian um, New Zealand ENSMAG magazine, um, um, bioprotocol and protein and peptide letters. Um, so the stage is yours, Marco. Thanks, thanks for the presentation. So here yeah, today I'm going to show you how we can use the DNP to um, understand a bit better interactions between antimicrobial peptides and bacteria. 
I start to introduce a bit the antibiotic resistance issue, although I don't think I have to. Um, what, what I would like to, uh, to say is uh, it's a very complicated system because a lot of bacteria are uh, beneficial for us. So we can't really use broadband antibiotics to kill all of them. And this is an example where uh, the gut flora has to be mainly preserved. And if you don't, you have uh, an outbreak of, of a particular strain, for example, Clostridiodis uh, difficile that gives you a disease. And that is normally uh, kept in check by other bacteria. And, and, and yes, bacteria are really good to, uh, to get uh, mechanisms to resist antibiotics. Uh, that is because they can modify their genetic material very easily. Uh, therefore, antibiotics, which are mainly uh, targeting uh, stereo-specific receptors, uh, will have a hard time to, uh, to fight this. Uh, they can uh, exchange this genetic material so that very quickly bacteria uh, become resistant to all type of antibiotics, either pumping out, uh, degrading, or using the coin. And that's where antimicrobial peptides are very interesting because they don't target a stereospecific receptor, they actually act on the lipid membranes. And it's harder for bacteria uh, to uh, change their uh, properties. So what they do is basically, most of the time, punch a hole in the bacteria where the efflux of metabolites means the death of bacteria. The, the particular peptide I'm going to talk today is this uh, maculatin peptide. It's found on the skin of the Australian tree frog that you found in uh, Queensland. Uh, it has good properties in terms of uh, activity against uh, bacteria, but it's actually specific to gram positive, as you can see, uh, for macromolar activities, especially uh, Staph aureus. And it doesn't really care if it's a meteor resistance uh, strain or not. It has mild. Um, hemolytic activity against red blood cells, and uh, it doesn't really do much on, on cancer cells. So we want to uh, characterize uh, this peptide a bit further, and first we did a lot of uh, biophysical studies. Um, as, as a typical linear cationic peptide, uh, it is not structured in, in aqueous phase, but in the presence of a lipid uh, system that would mimic either uh, E. coli or staph aureus, for example, you see in change in the uh, circular diaconism line shape, very typical of, of helical structures with two minima and a maximum, maximum here. What's also interesting is that the lipid uh, that uh, mimic uh, red blood cells or chaotic cells uh, shows that the peptide doesn't interact much uh, with this as it stays uh, unstructured. We did a bit of um, <clears throat> dye release to see uh, how much peptide is required to, uh, to dis disrupt the uh, barrier integrity. Um, and again, we, we saw some, some nice uh, specific uh, selectivity against uh, the charge uh, vesicles versus the uh, neutral ones that contains cholesterol. We did some other dye release where this time we actually trapped uh, a, a dye of a, a bigger size. Uh, this was a 40 kilo Dalton uh, molecule and a 4 kilo Dalton molecule. And we saw that as we are increasing the peptide concentration, uh, the release is a little bit exponential. So from this, we could uh, estimate that the size of the pore that would form the peptide to release uh, this type of dyes is about, uh, is between 1.4 to 4.5 nanometers. Then we use phosphorus and MR to see how the uh, barrier integrity is disrupted. And, and as expected, as you're increasing the peptide concentration, you see a, a rise of this uh, isotropic peak in the phosphorus signal. Uh, this is a static spectrum. Uh, and that means that you have an increase in the population of fast reorienting uh, lipids. So we hypothesize that uh, the, the peptide is actually forming what we uh, call a steroidal pole. So this, this is uh, all in vitro, obviously. And the big question is, uh, can that be translated to uh, in vivo type of uh, uh, knowledge? And so this is where uh, the DNP could be really useful. So we're going to focus on that part uh, now. And it is useful because it, it's providing this signal boost for low peptide concentrations in cells, uh, but it does require a radical source. And, 
that's where I will also introduce our strategy to have um, spin label pet tags for DNP. What's also interesting with the DNP is that at the moment, we, uh, we need to use cryogenic temperatures uh, so that uh, we preserve the system. But that gives us also a, a high sample stability because uh, as I will show, uh, the, the cells are cryoprotected, so they are resistant. And, and actually we always store bacteria at minus 80 degrees. So we know that uh, they, they can survive. And as usual, uh, the sample preparation is uh, critical. So uh, because we're doing things at um, a cryogenic temperature uh, and, and we need the radical, uh, there are a few aspects that are uh, important. One is uh, the uniform distribution of the radical uh, to get the, the highest enhancement factor we can. And also the, the core protections because obviously, uh, especially for biomolecules, uh, they can undergo a very bad uh, denaturation process or for example, phase separation things like this. So people have used uh, what they call the DNP juice, which is uh, mainly uh, glycerol as a coral protector. However, the, the presence of this uh, DNP juice is, is actually uh, reducing the sample filling factor, uh, and therefore uh, reducing the, uh, the signal you can obtain. And uh, for us, it was also interesting to uh, try to target specific regions uh, in, in the cells. So, uh, a lot of people have come up with radical grafted molecules uh, to locate uh, the radical, for example, in the lipid. You can have them in head group or acid chains. And then there's a bunch also of uh, amino acids that have um, radical uh, nitroxides in particular. So this is uh, what we've done, and that's uh, it's only the two peptides I present today. We have uh, tagged our uh, antimicrobial peptide actually as a carrier to target bacteria with uh, these nitroxide amino acids. So they uh, are located at the end terminus, and then we have two, one with a single nitroxide and one with uh, two nitroxides. Um, the idea is that with two nitroxides, you could actually uh, trigger what we call the uh, cross effect. That is technically better at 400 megahertz and moderate uh, spinning rates. So we characterize those uh, spin-able peptides by first classic NMR uh, solution NMR to get the structure out. Uh, so looking at noses and pincushion perturbations, uh, we were able to, uh, to, to have a, a nice helical peptide structure out of this. Um, we went a bit further and uh, characterized the spin-able peptides by EPR. Uh, we were especially interested to know if uh, for the single TOAC uh, peptide, uh, it would come to proximity and therefore act as a, a bar radical. Uh, EPR couldn't detect any uh, electron uh, and the peptide proximity. And then you also gave us the uh, distance between the two nitrosides in the bar radical peptide, and that was about 1.1 nanometer. Uh, surprisingly, there were no specific difference between the water versus the DMPC uh, encapsulated peptides uh, in the EPR line chain. So we characterized the enhancement. Uh, as you can see uh, in the red, this is the uh, without microwave and black with microwaves, and we see a nice enhancement. Uh, if I put it better into uh, numbers, uh, what we saw is that uh, the, the bar radical is, as expected, performing better with about uh, 20 to 27 uh, increase uh, in signal. What was also interesting is to, to see the uh, relaxation was actually better uh, with this uh, double to act. So this is a, a, another advantage that you can obviously have a shorter recycle delay and, and accumulate better signal to noise. Um, so that was quite promising. We, we did try to characterize where the peptide is. So we use again room temperature uh, and MR, uh, so it's state in MR, where we did uh, this uh, magic end explain carbon and proton uh, experiments. And then we just looked at the uh, paramagnetic um, PRE effect, sorry. Uh, and so as the radical comes close to a particular group or region in the lipid, you see a broadening of the signal. So it allows us to locate the radical pet, uh, the, sorry, the radical moiety near glycerol region. So we did a bit of uh, molecular dynamic simulations to try to characterize a bit further, uh, although this is again at room temperature, not at DNP temperatures. Uh, 
nevertheless, uh, we saw that uh, this uh, confirmation, the TOAGs were located just below the phosphorus head group. Uh, so this is a Z axis of the barrier. Uh, and then we did a bit of um, exposure to water and the first uh, TOAC was exposed to water, but not the second, so quite protected from, from the aqueous phase. The distance between the two nitroxides uh, fluctuates a fair bit, but again, we are at room temperature uh, around this 1.1 nanometer, which is confirming the EPR results. And the angle between the two nitroxides, which is also critical for uh, triggering the, the best cross effect, uh, is longer than uh, eight degrees, with again some fluctuations. So that's quite similar to uh, what has been recently. Um, published with the tiny pole series, uh, although they were designed for high field, but uh, this 1.1 and 110 degrees are actually optimal for the cross effects. So now in cell, technically now we, we the, the dream is to be able to do all those experiments uh, within bacteria and understand how our peptides uh, access to uh, or disrupt bacteria uh, in, in life. So uh, we did a classic um, E. coli growth uh, to OD.6, uh, our best centrifuge resistant, or basically wash the, uh, the urea uh, media, and then add the peptide and cryoprotectant. So cryoprotectant here would be three allos instead of uh, glycerol. We centrifuge the whole system and transfer this pellet into the rotor. All this takes about 30 minutes uh, and it's kept at four degrees. So we characterized the supernatant and we saw that there were no presence of the spin label peptide. So that tells us that all the, the, the radical peptides is bound uh, to the cell. And then we also did some uh, uh, viability test and the E. coli. Uh, after the NP experiments were still quite high in terms of uh, viability, so good survival rates. So the question we are asking is, uh, is the, the, the structure of the peptide the same uh, versus in vitro versus in vivo or in bacteria or in cell? And the, the, the fact that these peptides uh, create pores means they need to self-assemble. And this question has, has been hard to answer uh, even in vitro. So we, we, we're thinking, okay, can we do that uh, in, in vivo? So what we're doing here uh, is uh, we're mixing two uh, label peptides, uh, one with a carbonyl uh, and one with a nitrogen. And then a second peptide where these now nitrogens are quite separated in chemical shift. So only the midazole ring is uh, labeled and here only the, or the, the nitrogen is quite different. So we tested different radicals, just a proof of concept, uh, and we used the free TOAC or the amupoil, which is basically the gold standard at the moment. Uh, and we saw that the announcements were quite low. Is uh, okay, I guess, uh, for amupoil uh, recycle delay. However, when we use our peptides, we have see that we have a much higher announcement and, and the relapse cycle that they drops significantly. So this is a big boost uh, for, for the experiment. It has been also shown that uh, stability of uh, nitroxides are, are not so good in uh, biological samples. Uh, it's a lot of antioxidants and things like this that can uh, degrade the nitroxides. But as we demonstrated, these spin level peptides are located inside the membrane, and I think they're quite protected uh, from all these sources. So that's also why we have, I would say, decent enhancements. So now the question, what, what's happening with these peptides in, in bacteria? So to, to measure this, we did a reader experiments. Uh, so we measure the uh, distance between the carbon and nitrogen uh, atoms. But we did uh, what we call uh, frequency selective because we have a mix of all those signals so we can play with. One group would be the nitrogen uh, and, uh, on the uh, peptide backbone, and then one group would be the uh, nitrogen of the uh, in the ring. And so what we saw is that uh, the signal was only uh, defaced uh, when we focused the uh, experiment on the nitrogen of the, of the backbone and not the in the, in the ring. 
and we went to characterize the redor curve with using different defacing time, uh, and that gives us a, a distance of uh, 4.18 angstroms. So we, we are assuming uh, that uh, this is an intra uh, distance. Uh, so basically, we are observing this uh, kind of expected, uh, but only if it's structured as an helical turn, uh, that in fact should be about 3.9 angstrom, so not so far off. If we compare to uh, the, the structures that are known, uh, the distance between this uh, intra uh, nitrogen to carbonyl is about 3.8 angstroms. And then there's been a, a molecular dynamic study on the uh, eight mirror uh, showing uh, self assembly. And if I compute those distances, uh, they get to about 6.1 to 7.2 angstroms. And I would think that with the quality of, of the signal we have, uh, we should have picked up distances uh, of, of six to seven measurements. So I would say at the moment that we are thinking it is not the right uh, pore formation or uh, self assembly uh, mechanism for this peptide, uh, in, at least in E. coli. Uh, I have a couple of minutes. I just want to introduce that uh, the, 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 the grail now is to have a, a better labeling scheme for those peptides so that we can really compute the, the full structure. And for that, you need a, a fully labeled uh, peptide. So you can imagine to express an antimicrobial peptide in E. coli is not simple. And the second aspect that's difficult is that the uh, C terminus is amidated, and that is critical for the antimicrobial peptides activity. So we found out that uh, we can express uh, maculatin using two tags, one which is a uh, East tag CMO, uh, that is preserving the N terminus uh, native uh, sequence. And then if we use a self um, splitting NTM uh, tag called Charase A, under high uh, ammonium uh, bicarbonate, we can trigger C amidation. So we did this expression protocol and we managed to have a, a decent yield of the construct about 60 meg per liter, which you would think is fantastic, not too bad. Uh, but unfortunately, the size of the tag is massive. And therefore, when you cleave everything off, you're left with very, very little uh, antimicrobial peptide, about 0.1 to 0.3 milligrams per liter. Uh, we did attempt uh, an N15 uh, peptide, which was only 0.1 milligrams. So it's not really at this stage, I would say, a, a fully viable expression method. We, it is possible. And it's probably the only way to get a C amidated peptide. And obviously, we did an HSQC, and this was obtained in less than 10 minutes. So uh, at least there is prospect that uh, we can go a bit further, but we still need to improve this protocol if we want to expansive carbon labeling, for instance. All right, so with this, uh, I'd like to acknowledge all the people that have been working in the lab with us, uh, the funding source, and uh, for this thank you. Thank you, Marco. So if you have any questions, um, do you want to type it um, down the Q&A? But um, maybe I'll start. Um, so, so it looks like that you're trying to um, get some labeled peptides. Um, so have you considered um, self-ray maybe, like since it kills the bacteria when you express it? Uh, yeah, as I said, the difficulty, what we're trying to do is to have the CMEDated peptide because it's critical for activity. Uh, and it's not the only carboxyl group uh, in, in the sequence. So it, it is not simple uh, to, uh, to produce. So, and and so you usually, and for, for the, the, the spin labels that you put on the peptide, um, do you usually put it on the N, N terminal? Or yeah, N terminus, that's because we, uh, we have uh, some uh, in vitro uh, studies to show that this peptide inserts first from the C terminus in the membrane, right. leaving the N terminus a little bit exposed uh, to, the, to the aqueous phase. And so for us, it was better to, to, to keep the property of this membrane targeting if we have the uh, spin label uh, on the antennas. But th there is a lot of room to optimize this as well. I mean, we've, we've just used these two TOAC residues commercially available. 
uh, we believe that uh, we can probably get better enhancements if we, if we check, like if we change a bit the scaffold of this bar radical. Because uh, obviously it's a, it's a peptide bond, so there is a bit of uh, no flexibility. And as I said, the angle and, and the distance between the two uh, electrons is critical. Mm. That would be quite interesting in terms of the actual design. Of cool. Um, well, people are very quiet today. Um, but yeah, if you guys have um, any questions, um, you can always um, just directly message um, Marco. Um, but in the interest of time, maybe we'll move on to the next speaker. So, Angelo. So, uh, welcome again, everyone. We move back uh, to uh, US since we decide to be US friendly on this time. And the next speaker is going to be Andrew Newcomb. Uh, Andy got his PhD in physical chemistry at the University of Illinois with Chad Rienstra where he did solid state in MR of membrane proteins and fibrins. His thesis was on alpha synuclein and he contributed to the final structure of the fibril a few years after his graduation. He moved uh, uh, to Europe where he did his postdoc with Armut Oshkinat at the FM FMP in Berlin. He worked on very fast spinning solid state in MR and again membrane proteins. Uh, in Berlin, he started with a Fulbright Fellowship and he moved on into Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship. Uh, during his time in Europe, he spent uh, a lot of time in Lyon with, working with Guido Pintacuda, the CRMN. And now he's at Rutgers as, assist, as assistant professor since 2017. And his lab is uses solid state and computational methods to study membranes and peripheral membrane proteins. So Andy, whenever you're ready. All right, well, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to get to talk to everybody and it was really nice, it's always good when the, the lead-in talks uh, before you explain some of the things you wanted to talk about. It saves you time for later slides. So yeah, I'm gonna talk about um, very fast spinning and some of the impacts that due duration have on that. Um, well, this audience, of course, is well aware of, of how good solid state NMR is for a variety of systems. Um, and I, I was thinking during the first talk, uh, we should add capsids to this just because there's so many wonderful capsid talks nowadays. Um, uh, but anyway, the idea here is that there's a bunch of samples that you have to do solid state NMR for because they aren't soluble and they aren't crystalline enough to get x-ray data. Um, but the big challenge there is that um, the, the static spectrum, which we saw in the second talk, are very broad um, and they can give you some information, but they're, they're, they're not good for atomic resolution information. And so to get that atomic resolution information, we have to do MAS, we have to spin fast. Um, and so the idea here is the faster you spin, uh, the sharper your lines get, and that'll give you a nicer looking spectrum. And this is especially important when we're doing proton detection, which is kind of the, the, the place where we all want to try to be um, because of that extra sensitivity. Um, so the high, you know, proton has the highest gyromagnetic ratio, um, which is great. Uh, we utilize this with cross polarization in solid state NMR, um, but we also can use it for sensitivity on our detection. So sensitivity scales with uh, gamma to the three halves. So if you can get uh, Proton detection instead of carbon detection, you can get a, a factor of a, a factor of eight or so um, with your sensitivity, which is really nice. Um, this is extremely common in solution NMR to the point where where not doing it is called inverse detection, correct? But uh, but nowadays uh, we want to try to do it with solid state. Um, but you have two uh, uh, big challenges here. And it's the proton-proton uh, dipolar couplings. They're really strong. Um, and so here's your expression for your dipolar coupling. And you can see here that the gamma uh, factors heavily in that. So if you have two uh, gammas of proton here that's, that's squared, it's a big problem. Um, but so the two strategies for uh, getting rid of these couplings are to either uh, dilute your protons out, which would uh, uh, help with this uh, with this R to the third, or to spin faster. And so, of course, the faster you spin, the more you can average out uh, these interactions. But as Bayat's very fond of pointing out, we are no, spinning nowhere near fast enough to do that yet. Um, and so we have to we have to uh, figure out where we are in the regime of how not fast we're spinning uh, uh, to try to come up with uh, the best experience we can at any given individual spinning rate. 
Um, so that first strategy, the deuterating the protein, of course, is the easiest way for the NMR spectroscopists to get rid of uh, protons and uh, hardest for the people who have to make the protein. Um, but of course, if you deuterate your protein and then back exchange uh, at the exchangeable sites, which as was pointed out in the first talk again, is not always 100% possible. You can get a signal enhancement of something like three um, for the same amount of material just by uh, back exchanging out your uh, uh, protons uh, and getting those deuterium to, to help eliminate those, uh, those uh, couplings, gives you sharper lines and higher signal to noise. Um, and so this works really well for a lot of different samples. So I like to show this slide just because it, it, the first slide, I always talk about how we can do solid state NMR in a bunch of different samples. And I like to point out, you can also do proton detected NMR on a bunch of different samples. So microcrystalline SH3 and GB1, which is what you'll be seeing for the most of this talk. Um, but then also membrane proteins like the outer membrane protein G and those synuclein fibrils we talked about all give very similar 0.1 part per million proton line widths, irregardless of how big and how amorphous and how gross they are. Um, sample wise, um, the spectra all kind of look the same. Um, and so the bigger your samples are, the nicer um, uh, solid state NMR is just because its line widths are the same all the way across. Uh, so that's uh, the, the, the strategy here. Uh, now, so the question, and we've already talked a little bit today about uh, sensitivity, um, differences between carbon detection and proton detection, but there's a lot of considerations to be had inside of proton detection as well. And so when I got to Berlin, I, I really wanted to start thinking about this um, because it's, 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 it's not intuitively obvious to me at least how this, this, this fun graphic here from the National uh, NMR Lab in Canada, uh, that's a two euro cent size coin for, for everybody in Europe and an American penny size coin for everyone in the States. Um, these rotors get small very quickly in order to spin fast. So the, the, the speed of an MAS rotor is limited by the speed of sound at the surface of that rotor. And so if you want to spin faster, you need a smaller radius rotor. Um, but the, the, of course, the, 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 surf, the volume goes down with the square of a diameter. And so the maximum spin speeds of these rotors, so 20 or 30 if you're ambitious um, on these 3.2s, um, 40 on the sort of 1.9, 1.6s, and then 60 on the one threes, and then finally these new fancy 0.7s that can spin in excess of 100. The amount of material goes down much quicker than that, right? So this is a linear drop off, uh, you know, doubling in, in, in MAS rate and a halving of material. But the next step, that 40 to 60, you only get 20, you know, 50% more spinning speed, but you've got a factor of five almost in sample uh, volume. And so the question that I uh, set out to answer at the start of my time in Berlin, it was going to be a quick little three month project that's been five years on, um, was is this factor of five in uh, sample volume compensated for by this factor of 50% in uh, spinning rates. And so the, the reason that it's, that took so long to kind of figure out is of course you needed to take a whole bunch of data at a bunch of different spinning rates on a bunch of different samples, many of which were deuterated. And so it was a lot of material and it was a lot of different probes that are often, even in the case now in my own lab here at Rutgers, not available in most places. Why would you take the same experiment four different times on four different samples, right? Um, so it was, a, it, was a, it was a large effort, but I, I want to go over it just because I feel like it's a very interesting result that, that can be useful for everybody else to kind of think about. Um, so the spectra, of course, that I used for this analysis was the backbone assignment spectra. And for those of you that aren't uh, completely comfortable with this, it's basically we're using uh, three-dimensional experiments that are CNHs. And so we're trying to correlate the I residue, which has got these two carbons uh, to the nitrogen. So we do that through the CA. To, um, to the I minus one residue, which we correlate through the NCL. And so you get these nice looking 3D planes and you do them a backbone walk. Um, there's a whole suite of them. And so one of the other little side effects of this conversation uh, uh, I'd like to have today is that there's two kind of families of, of pulse sequences we do this, the ones that we were working on uh, in Illinois and the ones that we were working on in Lyon. Um, and luckily, because of when I switched uh, continents, I actually got to work very closely with the people who developed both sets. And so that is very helpful for me because I've, uh, I'm comfortable with both of them. And one of the things I'd like to talk about today is just how sometimes one of them's better, sometimes the second, and it's not always intuitive obvious why that would be. Um, so again, the, 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 the two sets of experiments here will go from the I residue to the I minus one. And in order to do that, you need to do NH transfers, you need to do NC transfers, and you need to do CC transfers. Um, and so uh, generally speaking, we use dipolar cross-polarization based transfers for this N 
H and the CH transfer. I know uh, they have, we have done this, the pure solution NMR type experiments, but I've spent a, a, a lot of time getting those, showing those works nicely in solution on solid state NMR, but the sensitivity for quote unquote real samples is kind of low. Um, and so these two transfers work really nicely, dipolar based. And then the question is, is when, do you wanna use a dipolar or a J, a, a nept based transfer, for these carbon-carbon transfers. And so the, 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 the experiments that Dong Hua developed in Chad's lab um, were all uh, dipolar-based carbon-carbon transfers, and the experiments that were developed in, in Lyon are all uh, inept-based transfers. And so one of the things we want to kind of think about is when is which each of those going to be better. Um, and so I'm going to talk about that as I go through the data today. Um, and so the idea here um, uh, was, again, we have a bunch of different samples and a bunch of different uh, uh, experiments. And so the, idea, uh, the, the color coding here is that 100% back exchanged uh, 40 kilohertz rotors are in red, 100% back exchanged uh, 60 kilohertz rotors are in blue. And then I have this, uh, this uh, optimal uh, proton uh, uh, rate of 60% back exchange, which actually got the resolution of the 40 kilohertz data up to the same resolution as the, as the 60 kilohertz data. So basically you had to get rid of 40% of your protons if you wanted to be able to see um, the same proton resolution. Uh, and then I, I measured the signal to noise per hour of these experiments um, for the NH experiment and then signal noise per day uh, for the, for the three-dimensional uh, carbon uh, assignment spectra. And so the idea here was uh, right off the bat, um, the, the, the full bigger rotor, the 10 milligram rotor, had 50% or so more signal intensity in the easy quote unquote experiments. Um, so the, the one, the NH2D, and then the single car um, uh, CN transfer, CNH3Ds. But by the time you've gotten the protons the same, uh, the proton resonance is the same, you were actually basically already breaking even uh, on the, the, the sensitivity for the 40 to the 60 kilohertz there. And so the interesting thing that happened after that, so this is sort of what we expected. You have five times as much stereo, you're, you're gonna get more sensitivity uh, out of more material. It's again, what was uh, shown in the beginning uh, here where you have a whole bunch more sensitivity uh, uh, in those NCA experiments, carbon detected when you have 30 milligrams of material, right? Um, but what's very interesting to me is as when we went further and further out, the harder experiments, the ones where you actually care about the sensitivity the most, right? Because this experiment takes 45 minutes or a day, depending on your sample. These experiments take four or five hours or two or three days, depending on your sample. But these guys out here, the ones that are multiple carbon-carbon transfers are the ones that are the majority of your signal averaging time. Um, and you can see here, by the time you get to these experiments, the 100% back exchange uh, 60 kilohertz data is just noticeably better um, when you have to do uh, these carbon-carbon transfers. And so the idea here is that because the, the, the due duration, um, uh, the faster spinning gives you better carbon T2s, we're actually seeing better uh, transfers for these carbon-carbon uh, uh, transfers when you go out uh, with the faster uh, spinning. And so the, the advantage of the faster spinning shows up in the, the uh, proton resolution kind of in these early samples, but it shows up in the transfer efficiencies in these later uh, experiments. And so that was really interesting. It wasn't exactly what I was necessarily expecting going into the result. And so it, it, was, it was pretty interesting um, to have uh, figured out. And then the second slide here um, is a good example based on, on what uh, we've been hearing from when it comes to labeling capsids or labeling peptides and stuff. And this is what your uh, uh, sensitivity looks like if you divide by milligrams. Um, and so if you only have a milligram of triply labeled uh, protein, you should by all means spin it as fast as possible. And that's sort of intuitively obvious. Um, but if you're sample limited, faster spinning seems to be better always. Um, and so that's, uh, uh, Maybe in not not strictly. You don't need me to tell you that, um, but I figured I would show it anyway. All right, so I want to go through a couple of examples now um, in quote unquote real proteins, and I'm not going to introduce the systems at all just because I don't have enough time in 20 minutes to really do that. Um, but this is a membrane protein we worked on in Berlin, uh, and basically the idea here is that what's labeled is the ATP binding cassette. It's the soluble uh, protein, but it's in membranes, and so basically what we show. Um, here is that you get dramatic improvements uh, when you go from 20 kilohertz uh, at 30% back exchange to 40 kilohertz at 60%. Spectra look just much, much, much better. 
very clearly what you want to do. We have resolved something like 200 out of the 240 uh, spin systems we were expecting to see. Um, but then we went up to 60 kilohertz. Um, and as you can see here, if you overlay those data, um, dramatic improvements in the proton and nitrogen uh, 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 line widths. Uh, but a little bit of hurt uh, in the sensitivity. Um, so basically, because uh, this rotor, the 60 kilohertz rotor, was packed with material that had originally been packed into this rotor, so it was this, it was back exchanged to the same percentage, we took a hit in sensitivity, but it was really, really worth it when it came to the assignment spectra, which I'll go over here quickly. Um, and so basically, the the again, the, the, the real key here is that the hard experiments have these carbon-carbon transfers, and those carbon-carbon transfers um, need the extra uh, uh, T2s that you get at faster spinning. Um, so here's the CANH, which is sort of that I residue experiment. Um, the 60 kilohertz data is on the left and the 40 kilohertz data on the right. And you can see it's, 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 it's similar, um, but the 40 kilohertz data is stronger for many of the spin systems, um, where basically you just have more uh, sensitivity in the, in, the, in the rotor that has more material in it. Um, so now when you move on to the CACONH experiment, um, in which you're, you're making that one uh, transfer, amusingly, the dipolar-based uh, DREAM uh, was better at 40 kilohertz, and the J-based uh, uh, mixing was better at 60. I tried both in both places. And so if you kind of zoom in here, you can see both sets of experiments give cross peaks. Um, but now the 60 kilohertz data has got more sensitivity, um, a little bit uh, stronger in two cases, in both of the cases highlighted here. And that was kind of true throughout the uh, experiment. Um, but it was that this, this, this longer transfer, the CBCA transfer, um, which is a little trickier to do with DREAM just because the CA and the CB uh, uh, chemical shift differences vary a lot by residue types. Um, it's tricky to do with uh, the inept-based sam uh, samples too, just for the same reason. Uh, C -beta, C betas are on both sides of the C alpha, so they're harder to refocus. Um, but the idea here is that for some of these uh, peaks, you just got absolutely nothing. Uh, in the dream-based spectra. And in, in on some of the other ones, they were really weak. And so basically, the 60 kilohertz data on this harder CC transfer experiment were between 1 to 5 to infinity times better uh, uh, at 60 kilohertz. And so the faster spinning on this real system um, really showed the benefits of that faster spinning uh, relative to the slower. Uh, and so if you're just trying to do residue tracking or something with a 2D, you can argue that the, 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 the advantage is less uh, pronounced, but if you're trying to do full assignments, you really kind of need the faster spinning. Um, so we moved on to 100 kilohertz. Um, and so the nice thing about 100 kilohertz, um, so we've moved back to GB1 here, is that the doubly labeled material uh, in blue here at 105 kilohertz is similar in resolution to the triply labeled material, the red, uh, at 40 kilohertz. And so that's been shown by a bunch of people. Um, but the, 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 the advantage there is that you don't have to do great. And so I'm going to talk about that a little bit in the last uh, few slides. But I have one more thing I wanted to talk about here, um, which is basically how I envision uh, us using proton detection moving forward uh, in a lot of the projects I've been working on are these peripheral membrane proteins. So this is a peripheral uh, membrane protein that binds lipids. I'm not going to talk about the details at all, but the solution binding site's been mapped uh, uh, the chemical shift perturbations have been mapped using solution MR. So here's a lovely uh, HSPC that Jackie in my lab took that perfectly recapitulates work that had been done 10 years ago, um, where basically when you put in the ligand, you can see binding uh, at the binding site, very clear. Um, but the nice thing is that in order to do this, we assigned the solution NMR HSQC uh, using the normal solution assignment suites. And so when we got to the solid state data, which is much broader, um, I, this, we're working on the sample prep. So next time I show this data to you, it'll hopefully look nicer. But this data is, it, it's not great, but it works. It's, and the, the, what I wanted to highlight to you guys is that here's the, the, the CB, CANH and the CACONH. And these data would be completely useless on their own. Not completely useless. You could not do backbone assignments with these data. There's a couple places where the, the walk is really clean. And then there's a bunch of people places where anybody who's telling you you can make a walk through this are, is, is, is trying to sell you something. Um, but because you have the solution NMR assignments and you have the fully assigned 3D spectra from the exact same connections, you can do this backbone walk uh, in the solid state. So you can assign the peaks in the C solid CANH uh, because you have the solution assignments. And so that's, I think, a really 
a huge thing that we can do now that we've moved on to these pro uh, detected experiments that allows us to push forward our solids experiments in situations where uh, a sample of, 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 of similar material can be acquired using solution NMR. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll move on now to the, the last thing I wanted to talk about, um, which was using these experiments to try to detect distances. And we're going to talk about hydrogen bonds. Um, but basically, one thing we thought about a lot with all of those experiments uh, was that the deuterated material is showing really good CNH experiments, right? So everything I showed you was an HCNH experiment. So the first step of all of that was an HCCP, but those were deuterated samples. And so somehow we were getting CP uh, a fair distance, right? Uh, those, those deuterated C betas are, are at least three angstroms away from the closest proton, but we're seeing really strong uh, cross polarization, which got me thinking how far does the cross polarization go? If I just blast out the long, the, 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 the CP, how far can I see? So that's what you're seeing here. This is a COH2D uh, where basically I did an HCH uh, and the second CP uh, is, is four or five or eight milliseconds depending on how, uh, how we were feeling that day. And you can see really long range peaks in SH3. Now, this isn't surprising, this is SH3. Um, but one of the cool things we, we noticed that is, is if you think about the, the orientation of a, of a normal secondary structure element, one of the closest protons to a CO is actually the one that's hydrogen bonded to in the secondary structure element, right? And so that's across the beta sheet in a beta sheet, or it's up a helix in a helix. And so the idea here is that the peak patterns could tell you something about the, about the, um, the structure. Um, so we use this pulse sequence, which, which is amusingly exactly the same as the, this pulse sequence the Pintacuda and company used to assign their HAs, with the only difference being we're using a much longer CP here because we specifically don't want to see the one bond. We want to see the longer uh, experiment instead, um, with the idea, again, being that you're seeing uh, the, 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 the hydrogen bonding partners either in the helix or the parallel and anti-parallel uh, beta sheets. Um, and so th we published this this year, um, uh, the, a, co a collaboration between uh, uh, Daniel Friedrich, in, in, who was still in Hartman's lab at the time, and, and uh, my student Jackie. Um, and the idea here is that the strongest peak you see, so we're, we're in the A24CO here, the strongest peaks you see are for the, the high residue, um, but the next the strongest peaks you can see are across uh, the secondary structure element. And that's, I think, very kind of interesting. We did the same set of experiments for the CA, but I'm running a little low on time, so I'm not going to talk about those as much. Um, and so you can see the same thing in the, uh, uh, the SH3 data for the, for the beta sheets. So basically, the idea here is that if we start on uh, the M25CA, the cross sheet peak here, this Y15 is extremely strong. So you have the I, the I plus one, and then the next strongest peak is the one that's across the beta sheet. If you do the same from the other side with the CO, you can see this, uh, the, the I peak, and then the cross sheet peak. Again, very strong and clearly showing up in these data sets. So if you were in a, in a, in a, a real quote unquote protein, you wouldn't see these weaker peaks, but you would definitely see the one across the sheet. It's kind of fun. Um, and then something similar over here uh, in, uh, in uh, a slightly different uh, part of the helix, um, where basically the, 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 the cross sheet peak uh, shows up again, uh, nice and strong. Uh, one s side effect of this whole operation is that you can actually assign prolines, which is kind of helpful if you're running into problems with those when you're doing your backbone walk. Um, because of course there's no NH on uh, the proline, but it is uh, sitting fairly close to a bunch of other NHs. Um, so you can actually walk in to that NH and get your assignments there, um, which is helpful uh, when you're trying to do your backbone assignments and you're running into trouble. You can also uh, work on your backbone walk uh, the same way you used to do it back before we did the, the backbone walks where you just kind of see these strips in the proton-proton spectra because you're basically walking through the, the, the um, uh, the backbone, uh, the, 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 the strips of the individual protons uh, show up uh, in these strips, the sort of the way that we used to do it before we did the, the full backbone walk uh, experiments. Um, and you can actually see the, 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 uh, the neighboring residues uh, as, you, as you line up through those strips. And so the last slide I want to show here is a 100 kilohertz version of this. So it's again, like I said, um, you can use doubly labeled material uh, to do this experiment, 
Um, but the cool thing that's happening here, um, and so this I've already shown you, but what I'm showing you here is GV1. And this is uh, uh, the experiment on uh, deuterated GV1 at 100 kilohertz. You've seen very similar sets of, uh, of cross peaks as you did um, with the, the 40 kilohertz data. Uh, if anything, actually less mixing. Uh, this is only two milliseconds of mixing, so it kind of makes sense. But you can see here at the 40 kilohertz, you're actually seeing further. Um, which is sort of what we were expecting. But the top one here is the protonated experiment. And that is really quite cool um, because the protonated experiment uh, as was, was demonstrated, I think uh, talked about a lot again by the people in Lyon, the, this proton here, the one on the H alpha is extremely, uh, uh, attracts a lot of the, of, of the magnetization, right? And so you can see the HA here much stronger than anything else in this experiment. Um, and then the, again, the peak that shows up uh, Next is the is the I peak, and then the only other peak that shows up in this short mixing time is the one that's across the the, the secondary structure element, the one that's next up on the helix, the next turn. And so we're spending a lot of time thinking about this 100 kilohertz data. So I don't have uh, full results to tell you about yet. So hopefully that will be done uh, soon. Uh, but this this uh, ability to use the the normal uh, assignment spectra to get both the amide proton and the HA proton in the same experiment is quite uh, helpful uh, in terms of trying to assign those that that's com combine the assignments from those two sets of assignment spectra, the ones that uh, that that the, the guys in Leon talked about a lot. All right, um, so here's the 800 where the 100 kilohertz data was assigned and the 600 where the four, uh, 40 kilohertz data is. Um, this is a picture of the group from before uh, COVID got started. Um, Jackie is the person who uh, did most of the work I showed you here from my lab. And then the RMP was made by Anya and the, the, um, uh, the first author on the, the hydrogen bond the paper is uh, Daniel from Hartman's lab at the FMP, who is now uh, a postdoc. Uh, at Harvard, who has graduated. I'm Thank happy to very much. take questions. Andy. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. I really enjoyed it. And you have a question from Anya. Was the temperature the same between solid and solution? Um, the temperature is pretty similar. Um, so, so here, I don't know if can go back to the the, the, the solution NMR was done at room temperature. Um, and we had the, the, we had the um, uh, zero 07 at minus five or zero. I don't remember exactly. And so we're expecting uh, the zero 07 to be at the same room temperature, maybe slightly warmer. Um, one of the things you can see in the, uh, the, the, the 2D here, the GV1 2D, is that the temperature at 40 kilohertz uh, is not, this is, everything's lagging and I'm clicking too fast. The temperature at 40 kilohertz and the temperature at 100 kilohertz are a little different. Um, so there's definitely uh, some extra heating uh, we're seeing uh, in the zero sevens. I have one more question for myself. Uh, mm -hmm. I you can distinguish eventually between intra uh, molecular uh, hydrogen bond and intermolecular eventually in crystals or sedimented compact samples? Yeah, it's a very, it's a very tricky question. And those uh, the, trying to identify crystal contacts or, or, or you know, in, in fibrils, the, the neighboring uh, molecules or in capsids, the neighboring, um, the neighboring, uh, you know, the dimer interface instead of, uh, instead of the intra is always a challenge. And the best way I, we can think to do it is to dilute things and see which peaks disappear. That's always been the, the, the best and it's a nasty way of doing it. Um, the nice thing about uh, measurements like this that go from nitrogens, quote unquote, this is a proton, but HN to C, is you can think about making 50-50 mixture samples um, where you measure a nitrogen carbon distance. I did it with TDOR carbon detected for the synuclein fibrils, but in this experiment, you could do it from the HN filtered to the, the, the carbon. Um, and where the, then if you saw a distance, it would have to be intermolecular. And so that could be very helpful. Of course, you've lost half your sensitivity. Um, and so those experiments are always really hard. Um, but it's maybe easier than if you have to go like a, whatever, a three to one or a five to one dilution and hope you, you know, saying a peak disappeared because you got rid of 80% of your sample is kind of like, okay, but <laughs> do you have enough sensitivity to be sure that that's a, a real effect and not a... You yeah, have another question from Anonymous attendee. How about the available temperature at ultrafast MAS? How does that affect the hypothetical choice of rotor size 
for biomolecular mass NMR experiment? It's another, it's another great, it's yeah. a very great question in a sense, because uh, the 40 kilohertz rotors, we can get cold, right? We can get those 40 kilohertz rotors down to minus 50 or something, minus 40. Um, and the, the really fast 0.7s and the, the one threes, we haven't been able to get that cold. Um, and so if you are doing something like some of the lipid experiments we're working where you really want to freeze something out, um, there's a reasonable argument that you need to be using the smaller rotors for right now um, for that reason entirely. Um, and so it, it, it's, a, it's a very good point. Um, and it seems like um, some of the newer modules are a little better at VT on these faster spinning. Like the overall sample heating is not all that different um, because it's, again, it's the speed of sound on the surface of the rotor. So it's the same amount of friction, quote unquote. The problem is, is the smaller and smaller coils make it really hard to blow VT gas on these samples. Um, so you have big problems, not big problems. You just need to pick experiments that don't mind being at room temperature. <laughs> and I think it's gonna be a last question. How often do you have rotor crashes that destroy the coal or and the stator? Do you have a methods to make sure that the rotor can spin at higher than 100 kilohertz for the extended periods for that acquisition? Every 07 I have lost has lost on the way up. Once it's up to spinning, I haven't had problems. Maybe that's just luck on my part. Um, it seems to be changes in spin rates that cause things to crash. Um, and it's a non-zero number of, of coils I have completely destroyed at all of these spinning rates, at all of these, at all of these spinning rates uh, when rotors crash. Um, it's, it's just, it's just <laughs> part of the price of doing the fast spinning solid state NMR. I mean, 3.2s blow up too, right? I think I might've, I might've crashed more three twos than I have the fast ones, to be honest. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it takes your coil out and you don't have an instrument for three months and it's not any fun, but um, well, every analytical technique has things that take the instrument out for a while, right? So. Thank you very much, Andy. And I think it's time to move on to the next speaker. Uh, There's gonna be Art Palmer and I will give the floor to Carol. Thank you. I'm going to introduce Palmer. Uh, during his PhD uh, at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, he developed the technique of high order autocorrelation in fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. Palmer made the transition to NMR as a National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellow with Dr. Peter Wright. There, Palmer co developed with Paul, um, Wright, Mark Rains, and John Kevinak the sensitive haste. HSQC and related experiments and began his first developments and applications of NMR spin relaxation to characterize macromolecular dynamics. Nowadays, Palmer serves uh, as an interim chair of the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biophysics and an associate dean for graduate affairs at Columbia University Medical Center. He also uh, is the di director of the NMR spectroscopy uh, at the New York Structural Biology Center. And Palmer uses NMR spectroscopy and molecular dynamic simulation to elucidate the coupling between conformational dynamical properties and biological functions of proteins. So thank you for being here and sharing your career with us and it's all yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm not really going to tell you any science today. I'm going to talk to you as advertised um, about my career with an emphasis on mistakes that you shouldn't make. This is a revision of a talk I gave a few years ago. Um, I apologize to those who might have heard the earlier version. I don't think I've gotten a whole lot smarter in the last couple of years. So 
So wig history in the field of history is an error that presents the past as an inevitable progression towards improvement. And I'll tell you at the outset that this is not how my career progressed and it's not how the careers progressed of most of my colleagues. And I think the talk will make that very evident. You just heard the chronology and I'll just say two things about this slide. At the very bottom, as the introduction said, I'm the Associate Dean for Graduate Affairs and also Director of NMR Spectroscopy at the New York Structural Biology Center. And I emphasize these because it's very rewarding to get this stage of one's career where you can do some things for the greater good. In the first case, the greater good of our graduate program at Columbia Medical Center, which is about 450 graduate students that I'm responsible for in some sense for their progress through the PhD. And as director of NMR spectroscopy at NYSBC, I help make high field NMR technology available to all the different research groups around New York City. Now the other red highlight there is you'll see that there's a four year gap between my BA in chemistry and then going back to graduate school, first in the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan, and then ultimately in the Department of Chemistry at the University of North Carolina. And there are actually three gaps, one is, or two gaps, three activities, one is buried. I actually left undergraduate school for a year and worked as a technician most of the time doing analytical chemistry for a company called West Coast Technical Services in California, largely doing mass spec. And then between undergraduates, I went back to undergraduate school and graduated. And then between undergraduate school and graduate school, I worked again, mostly doing mass spec for a company that cleaned up hazardous waste dump sites and then teaching high school for a couple of years at Western Reserve Academy in Ohio. So one lesson I learned for advising undergraduate students is a few years work experience after undergraduate school can be very beneficial for many students like me, but going back to graduate school after three years is difficult. I when I went back to graduate school, I could hardly remember how to integrate anything. Um, the other lesson here is everyone's career has zigs and zags, um, but the zigs or the zags can be overcome. I believe that hard work is rewarded, but as you'll see in the next few slides, it's not rewarded with a lot of support by other people. So, was somewhat talked into going back to graduate school by Steve Levine at the University of Michigan. I had worked with him at OH Materials cleaning up dump sites. And he convinced me to then come to Michigan. I should also mention earlier Colin McKay at Haverford College who introduced me to research. Colin recently passed away, but he taught undergraduate physical chemistry at Haverford College for 50 years, um, a standard I'm not sure that I'll match. But after a year at the University of Michigan, I decided I was more interested in biophysics. I moved to the University of North Carolina and this is the first graduate student of Nancy Thompson. And that's probably what I'm most um, proud of in science as being her first graduate student. When I interviewed, actually, I had applied to North Carolina because I was interested in the work of other people. But by the time I interviewed, I discovered they had left the university and the director of admissions for the chemistry department had a one paragraph description of the work of this newly hired assistant professor who was going to arrive from Hardin McConnell's group 
And basically on the basis of that one paragraph, I ended up going to Chapel Hill and working for her. And then many of you online will know Peter Wright, who was my postdoc advisor at Scripps. I want to make mention of another very special mentor, Mark Rance, who I also met when I moved to Scripps. In fact, my first paper in NMR spectroscopy is with Mark uh, on the sensitivity improved HSQC experiment in 1991. Our last paper just appeared in the Journal of Magnetic Resonance. We submitted that paper only a few days before Mark unfortunately passed away. And altogether, we wrote 29 papers in one book together. So that's been, he's been an incredibly important mentor, collaborator, and friend. But those five people have, through my whole career, been important mentors and sometimes have guided me and sometimes have pushed me. Um, and I can't really overestimate their importance to whatever success I've had. Now, as a graduate student, I did fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. Here's just some data from my last field. And the most obvious career path for me at that point was to do a postdoc with Watt Webb or one of the other pioneers in these sorts of biophysical fluorescence techniques. Had I done that, I probably today would be happily doing single molecule fluorescence. But I'll also emphasize that mentoring sometimes is a single conversation. And I can remember walking down the hallway one day and passing my thesis, a thesis committee member named Lee Peterson, who is a molecular dynamics computational chemist, who told me interesting things are happening in NMR and handed me a paper by Kurt Vutrick. And reading that paper got me somewhat interested in trying to do relaxation measurements in proteins as a postdoc, but I had never seen a high field NMR machine. I didn't know any NMR spectroscopists, but later that spring, Martin Karpelis came to UNC to give a series of lectures and he had office hours every day and most people were terrified of him. So there was plenty of time to go talk with him each day about his lecture. And finally, at the end of the week, he asked me what I was doing next. And I explained my dilemma. And he said, you should contact Peter Wright. So I did. So that short encounter was absolutely pivotal. So again, a lesson I would say is even very short-term interactions can count as significant mentoring. However, there's a sidelight to that. Um, and one lesson is don't accept the current state of things. What's shown here is a histogram of the number of papers published using fluorescence correlation spectroscopy since its invention in 1974. And you can see there's only a few papers a year. The red box are my three years as a graduate student and most of those papers are mine. Well, one of the major limitations of the technique was sensitivity. And the detector was a photomultiplier tube. And what I should have been thinking about is the major weakness of this technique is its lack of sensitivity. What can we do to improve sensitivity? But I didn't think about that. And I moved on to NMR. And then you can see that there's a sudden increase in the number of papers up to almost 400 a year. And that's because the avalanche photodiode was introduced as a detector for the FCS experiment. And that made the experiment much, much easier to do. The avalanche photodiode was invented in the 50s. So it was certainly around had I paid attention to the real problem with my experiment, its sensitivity. So again, it's very easy to accept 
the current status quo in whatever field you're in, but you should really be thinking, what are the key weaknesses in my current field and how do I address them? In any event, I was lucky. I landed at Scripps at the time when Gerhard Wagner's first papers had appeared on using inverse and AMAR methods, proton detected methods to measure carbon-13 and then later N15 spin relaxation for studying dynamics of proteins. So I arrived in 1989 intending to do this in Peter's lab and to some extent was either inspired or scooped by papers that appeared from Josh Wand, Lewis K, Dennis Torshin, Ad Bax, not long after I arrived. Nonetheless, we, Peter, Mark, Dave Case, David Millar and I managed to join this renaissance of applying NMR techniques then for studying protein dynamics. One of the lessons I learned from Peter was not to worry so much what people in your group did as long as they were doing really good work. And I ended up publishing papers with, I think, five different PIs while I was at Scripps because Peter basically let me work with whoever I thought was interesting to work with on a particular, particular problem. Well, at this point, I finished my postdoc and I wish there was a magic formula for success as a graduate student or postdoc. And I don't think there's any particular magic. You need to find research areas you love. You have to work as become as expert and accomplished as you can. Um, be opportunistic in finding areas where your skills and approach are underutilized but potentially impactful. An example I like to use is Hashim al-Hashimi, who most of you will know. He was trained in Jim Prestigard's lab doing RDC measurements in proteins, but recognized these methods weren't being used in nucleic acids. He went to Dinshaw Patel's group as a postdoc because Dinshaw's group had lots of nucleic acids and the expertise Hashim needed to learn in order to set up his own research lab making and studying nucleic acids. And anyone who has followed his career can say that was really a brilliant decision to identify where his particular skills as a graduate student could be applied in new areas. It should be clear from the mentors I've worked with that as much as possible work for and network with mentors with track records of furthering the careers of mentees. But of course, I was the first student of a new faculty member and the training was fantastic. And everyone has to have a first student and it's really an honor to be somebody's first student. As part of this, I would say I sometimes have graduate students talk with me about joining my lab as a postdoc. And, but mostly what we do in the lab historically leads on to faculty careers. So these grad, graduate students who have talked to me who say, you know, my real goal is to be a group leader in a pharmaceutical company, no matter how great they are and how much I could see they would help my lab. You know, I've sometimes counseled them that you should go work for person X who has a track record of postdocs going on to be group leaders um, in the biotech or the pharmaceutical industry. So I would say if I'm a good mentor, it's for a certain group of people, not for everybody. And you students or postdocs have to find the mentors who are, you know, are good matches for what they want to do in their careers. Well, I came to Columbia in 1992. Why I came to Columbia, colleagues, students, colleagues, students, colleagues, students, so on and so forth. The equipment actually wasn't, was less than optimal. It was a third time on, on a Brooker 500 megahertz NMR spectrometer. Um, 
why I stay at Columbia, colleagues, students, colleagues, students, so on and so forth. I had always imagined as an ex-high school teacher that I would go not to a medical school, but to an undergraduate teaching department and teach undergrads. Uh, but advice from Peter when I had the job offer from Columbia was to go to Columbia, establish my research career, and then I would have opportunities to move elsewhere if I wanted to. Although every time I've thought about leaving Columbia, colleagues, students, colleagues, students have kept me here. My own lesson that I've drawn from this is you can buy equipment, but you can't buy good students and colleagues so easily. And in the end, the equipment uh, issues were solved first by grants to Columbia from the NIH and NSF and ultimately by building the New York Structural Biology Center. So when I started, there weren't really books telling you how to become a faculty member. There are more books now, but I still like this one that I read when I was assistant professor. This is by a business professor, Linda Hill at Harvard, who studied the transition in the computer industry from salespeople to group leaders for salespeople. So sales groups or, or, or salespeople are organized in small groups. They have a manager. The manager is usually somebody who's been promoted from within the group to now be the manager. And it's really the same transition from being a postdoc to being an assistant professor. And I think the key lessons in this book are very relevant to our own fields. And the most important thing is an assistant professor, you have to learn how to lead others. Your success is now based on the success of your students and postdocs, much less so than what you do with your own hands and increasingly so as you become more senior. Whereas a postdoc or graduate student, a lot of your success is based on what you do with your own hands. And then in red, the process of becoming a manager slash assistant professor is primarily one of learning from experience, trial and error, observation and interpretation. Observe those you think are successful and try not to make the same mistake more than once. But in any event, I highly recommend this book. It's still in print. It's very short. You can read it in an hour or two. So career advice, such as I can give it. The biggest challenge is time. The easiest thing to give away is time, but what you will need most is time to think. A warning from Nancy Thompson, my thesis advisor, work will be piled on you till you break. And advice from Barbara Lowe, uh, emeritus professor in my department who recently passed away. She and I taught together until she was 92 years old. Her advice, just say no. That's not advice I'm good at following, but I recommend it to you. The second biz biggest challenge, and this is really what Linda Hill's book ab is about, every person in your group will be different. You have to figure out how to make everyone in your group maximally productive in their own way. And that means everybody in your group has to be managed in a different way. Importantly, you will be known as much for who you train as for what you publish and for most of us, the people we train will be our legacy long after our papers are moldering on the internet or in a library. Take advantage of opportunities when they arise. I had no intention of writing this book. This book was really John Cavana's idea and he talked the rest of us into joining him and it's been, you know, it's been my whole career. It's been incredibly rewarding to continue to work with John, Wayne, Mark, and Nick, who I met 
back when I was a beginning postdoc. And it's been incredibly rewarding to have students and postdocs tell me that they learned something from the book. The lesson from Peter was let talent run free. So I repeat it here. Um, Mika Laki was my first postdoc. One day I said, why don't we try to do something with chemical exchange line broadening? And he came back a couple of days later and said, we should try off resonance R1 row. And that really led to some of the first impactful papers from my group as an assistant professor. And that's obviously R1 row experiments have been a thread through my whole career. We continue to work on them. Don't forget old problems. Come back to them, think about them again. You may have new ideas. When I was a postdoc, we wrote a paper that concluded that CPMG experiments wouldn't work in macromolecules because of the problem of differential relaxation during the Tau CP paper. But then in 1999, Pat Loria, when he was a postdoc in the group, figured out how to fix that problem, leading to what's called the relaxation compensated carpacel mebum gill experiment that has really led to a lot of the relaxation dispersion experiments that are now done. But if we had decided the door was completely closed back in 1992, perhaps we would never have thought again about the idea in 1999. Grant success, the most important advice I can give is from Doug Douglas Adams, the author of A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Those of you who have read the book know that on the cover of the Guide to the Galaxy are the words, don't panic. This is a coffee cup that says, don't panic on it. My colleague, Barry Honig, told me when I arrived as an assistant professor and was writing my first grant that there are three things that lead to success, good ideas, good preliminary data, and good writing. Don't forget item number three. Early on in my career, there was, I came across an announcement for a grant opportunity and time was short. I wrote the grant and turned it in and a reviewer wrote, this is so poorly written, I can't believe the author is serious about doing the work. And I've tried to take that lesson to heart. If you're discouraged about grant, your grant writing, you can come look at my file drawer full of rejected grants. Uh, my advice is read the criticisms, put them aside for a week, and then read them again put your ego aside, I would have had many more in, impactful projects that I simply followed the suggestions from referees. They're try, usually trying to help. I'll put a plea in for teaching. Teaching is how you learn your own discipline. Students always catch you on what you really understand versus what you're just repeating because somebody else told you that particular information. Teaching is how graduate students know about your laboratory. It's a recruitment tool and it's incredibly rewarding experience when either a student gets it or you suddenly have an insight into how to present the material in a new way. Choices have consequences. When I first came to Columbia, I imagined that we'd restart doing fluorescence experiments like I did as a graduate student once the NMR operation was up and running. This didn't happen, and why not? Well, the lab was making fast progress and I didn't want to divert time or resources. I got busy writing the NMR book, and then we started planning and building the New York Structural Biology Center. As Nancy Thompson told me once, the hardest thing in science is getting time, people, and money together simultaneously. And in this case, I didn't. But then one thing I 
lesson I would draw from this is every choice to do A is at the same time a choice to do B. It didn't really occur to me at the time as I was deciding on writing the book or getting heavily involved with the New York Structural Biology Center that those decisions ultimately were going to preclude restarting to do fluorescence experiments in a serious way. So my advice is be intentional about your choices. Your opportunities pass quickly. When Mika Laki was near the end of his time in the lab, we had a collaboration with Dinshaw Patel in which we did relaxation N15 relaxation experiments in a UUCG tetra loop RNA hairpin. It was the first application of these methods to nucleic acids. We had our foot in the door. We had the connection to the Patel laboratory, but Mikael and Radovan went back to Europe and I didn't actively recruit a graduate student or a postdoc to continue the research. And we never followed up on it. I had no really offsetting good choices to counterbalance that. I simply made a poor decision. Recognize your opportunities when they're staring you in the face. Don't let them go by, grab them and run. Managing people is always the hardest job. And one's biggest regrets are the students or postdocs you could have mentored better. Um, it's easy to avoid recognizing or addressing personal issues. Luckily, universities are better and better at providing assistance and support to help you with that part of your job. Um, another Failure is failure to recognize when to pull the plug. Hard problems in your lab can only be solved by talented individuals, but keeping a talented individual on an unsolvable problem is a waste of talent. And you have to sometimes rely on thesis committees and collaborators to tell you that you're just wasting this person and it's time to switch projects and it may be that this unsolvable problem needs another decade of technology development before it's solvable or another decade of your thinking about it, but letting a very talented people person work forever on something that can't be solved in real time isn't wise. And then unwillingness to make hard decisions, kicking the can down the road is human nature, but it doesn't help anyone, your goal is to help your students and postdocs have productive careers and see what is best for each individual. So most of you listening are NMR spectroscopists and you're nervous about the future of NMR. So does NMR have a rosy future? Here's a quote from a paper in 1981. A few years ago, biological NMR was described by a cynical observer as quote, the technique with the eternally rosy future. In some respects, he was right. 25 years later, another review article says, that rosy future is now upon us, brought about by great advances in instrumentation, technology, and theory. We're now 18 years later. I think the present and the future remain rosy. I'm optimistic. You've heard great talks today. Every time NMR seems stagnant, fantastic graduate students and postdocs open up new avenues. And I think that will continue. Increasingly, the challenge is to get biology reconstituted into the NMR tube or rotor. If you can do that, there are powerful NMR methods available now and they continue to be developed. And that's fantastic. We can answer the questions we really want to answer, the biology questions, not the questions of how do we keep the spectrometer from burning out amplifiers. Increasingly, I think the NMR spectrometer will be the world's best detector for biophysical experiments on biological systems and one Fantastic example of this is Adbax, Adbax's work using the NMR to detect pressure jump experiments, classic experiments in chemistry that go back decades and decades. 
Don't be risk adverse. That's natural as one gets more established. Use NMR for its strengths and adopt other techniques for theirs. And I would again say Julie Fagan is a fantastic example of this, who's somebody who over time has incorporated NMR, crystallography, cryo-EM, and other techniques into her own work as she's needed them. So just to finish up, I'm sorry it's running a little longer than I hoped, but why I keep being a professor, the dedication of my thesis reads to my parents who first encouraged me to wonder. As a scientist and professor, I can every day wonder at the beauty of nature and wonder about those scientific problems that I find appealing. Every paper we publish solves some puzzle or makes some insight that miraculously emerged from my brain. Few people in the history of the world are fortunate enough to get this opportunity to make their living based on what they think up every day. And working with students and postdocs is just endlessly invigorating and rewarding. And as you saw in the beginning, I had experience working in industry and I never really liked having a boss. Here's the acknowledgement slide. Nothing happens without the group. My goal is to attract graduate students and postdocs who are more talented than me. The alternative generally seems like a very bad plan. I've been fortunate to do so. And as I said, this is why I stay at Columbia. In very small print are the students and postdocs who have been in my lab and if you have very good eyes or squint, you'll see it's a really remarkable bunch and my success is really due to them. Again, thank you for this opportunity. I hope that something here helps you avoid some of the mistakes that I've made. Thank you.